Welcome to everybody. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by uh, Malcolm Pye, CEO of Benchmark, and Mark Plampin, the CFO. And they're here to talk about the state of the business as well as update us on the recent interims, which were very much in line with expectations. So, Malcolm, perhaps we might start with a bit of perspective because it's nearly five years since Benchmark came to the stock market. You've achieved an awful lot, it seems, in building the infrastructure uh, of the group now. How do you assess it relative to your, your ambitions and, and strategies and indeed forecasts way back five years ago? Yeah, it's been um, quite, there's been, it's been quite a considerable pace that we've been setting and uh, some, some of the time we've um, been taking opportunities that happened Perhaps not, you know, at the at the time when we would have liked them to happen. But when they happen, you've got to go with it. In particularly in, when you're working in a world like ours, which is very fast moving, the, and where the opportunity is very considerable. Um, and if you look back over what's happened, um, we have some of the some of the objectives we set out as being our long term objectives. At IPO. We have. Uh, fulfilled in quite a short period of time. So we've built the uh, breeding and genetics business up from a very small start um, at IPO to now um, with the largest player in aquaculture genetics. Um, we've started with, again, very small start in advanced nutrition. And again, now we're, we're the largest player in aquaculture in advanced nutrition. So, you know, that's been done through some quite um, significant acquisitions. Um, the timing of which was not entirely in our control. We had to we had to take the opportunities when they came along, but you know, and that's been done at a hectic pace. But now that that is done, um, we feel very um, satisfied with the with the results um, in that we have now built the infrastructure um, that we can uh, continue to grow organically and build a very significant business and really take the opportunity that's there in aquaculture technology. So we look back on it and, and say that in terms of the business growth, business development side of the, of the business, that that has been um, a good process and, and, and we're very pleased with the, with the outcome. Of course, along that path, there have been um, some bumps in the road, um, which, and some, um, Elements of the of the development which haven't come um, in line with the, the way in which we originally envisaged, and particularly in terms of the pipeline, um, the development of new products. And I think a lot of weight has been put on the development of our first, if you like, really big product, the, the first blockbuster, which is Ectosan. Um, and there we've had delays, but and I think that's affected our, you know, that has affected our share price. But it's also vindicated the, the portfolio and the R&D that has been an ongoing feature of the business even long before you, you came to the stock market. Yes, and I think, you know, we, we feel that we, we have a diversified portfolio of products coming through the pipeline. Um, and I think the, this, this first very high profile one being delayed is unfortunate, but it, you can't always predict exactly the timing of every step along what, the road of uh, what is a very technical you know, development process with lots of regulatory um, elements that need to be you know, filled in as you, as you go along that path. Um, but you know, with having said that, we are the, nothing fundamentally off track about Ectosan. In fact, actually, we've made a huge amount of progress. Um, and if you go back to 2009 when we started the Ectosan program and said by 2018 you would be at field trial stage, you would have Ectosan working um, in the field, you would have Clean Treat um, operational, you know, and said, would you be would would you would you be satisfied that with that? I would have said in 2009 I would be delighted by that because this is. Uh, actually a breakthrough product for our industry um, and it's a whole new approach for aquaculture. The, you know, the whole concept of being able to treat animals with having no impact on the environment mm -hmm. is a very big step forward and you know we are... And if anything the need for that is, is getting is ever greater. Ever greater. So mm -hmm. you know in a sense you know our original vision is, is um, you know now it's, a, it's actually coming 
uh, to the point where we can start to expose it to the market, I think that is something that is being you know, shown to be very much a requirement for the future. So, you know, we feel that we have some work to do. We have to complete this piece of the process. And I think doing that will, will settle everybody down and give, it, give the outside world a real sense of, of um, what we can do um, with these new technologies, exciting product developments. Um, and we have that work to, to finish, but we are making really good progress. Yeah, and again, it, it's a, a snapshot, but the six months that you've just reported uh, again, contain no acquisitions. So all the growth was organic, yep. you know, testimony that, to the infrastructure that, that's now in place. And in terms of, of drivers for, for what you do, uh, it still seems that there is an expanding human population, there is hunger, there is need for, for protein and, and fish, and particularly salmon, seems to be, uh, again, reflecting positive trends. Yeah, and I think if you, if you look at the macro picture, you know, the, all, of the, all of the strong drivers in aquaculture are still there. Um, you know, salmon is, as you say, the, the, the one that really evidences that, where everybody can see that the, you know, the price, the strength of this price for salmon, the continuous growth, the growth in demand, which seems to be you know, uh, telescoping out into the future. Um, so it's a very positive environment for salmon. Salmon's one of the big species in the, in the benchmark portfolio. A lot of what we do is aimed at the salmon industry. But also, there is massive potential in the shrimp industry. Shrimp has been growing at a similar rate, or actually a higher rate than salmon. It's had its um, trajectory disrupted by some big disease challenges. Um, and, and, you know, it's important that we resolve those. And the, a lot of the work that Benchmark does is around tackling those, those kind of problems. And we can see the shrimp industry as a major driver of growth going, going forward for here for ourselves, but also in the aquaculture industry in general. There's tremendous demand for the product. Um, and we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel with some of these problems. You know, we, we believe that our new shrimp genetics that we're having trials in Asia right now, showing good results, offers a lot of potential to the industry. So, um, you know, I think there is another whole positive story starting there. Um, and then behind shrimp, we have tilapia coming along. Mm -hmm. It's further back in its development, but again, it's going to be a very big product for, for in terms of production of high quality protein. Um, we're making lots of progress with new, with, uh, new technologies in the tilapia arena. And even behind tilapia, there are new species coming behind that. So the macro picture still looks very strong. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that sounds like a, a good summary of where the genetics division is at, at the moment with, with shrimp breeding very much to the fore. Do you want to say a little bit about advanced nutrition in the context of the results just reported? Yeah, advanced nutrition um, is growing strongly still, um, both in terms of uh, revenue and in EBITDA. That is there is a pleasing trend within there, within advanced nutrition, um, which is again one that we've looked for, that we predicted, and, and we've been looking to see come through, which is the development of more sophisticated larval diets. So this is diets that we call replacement diets that replace live feed um, in the feeding programs. Um, these are higher margin products for us, um, and we are seeing the growth in, the, in that part of the business um, continuingly to continuing to um, go up, you know, so that's growing faster and faster. In fact, that piece of that part of our business has tripled in six years now. So, and we're seeing that acceleration still still going on. And we have new products coming through the pipeline, which we think will fuel that even more in the future. So, there is strong demand out there for this type of product. And here we're gaining market share, but we're not gaining market share against other sophisticated players like us producing high quality uh, replacement diets. We're really gaining market share from the kind of less sophisticated approach to feeding shrimp and larval finfish where they use cheaper, lower, lower quality products um, to try and achieve a lower cost of production. And in actual fact, what we're demonstrating is using the more sophisticated product range that we produce does actually deliver a lower cost of production and we're converting more of the, um, of the uh, producer community to that approach. So this is a, a really good trend. It's very, very beneficial to us. And, and, and how far do you think the, the replacement of natural artemia by the, the next generation larval uh, 
products will go? Will there always be a requirement or are there specific characteristics for natural Artemia or, or will the, you know, the artificial market overtake the fresh market? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I mean, we, we've, we believe that there will always be a requirement um, for Artemia, at least into the foreseeable future from where we are today. Um, but as at aquaculture grows, Artemia is a limited natural resource. So, you know, that we have to be able to find more and more, um, you know, we have to be able to, to create higher levels of replacement for it. Um, but new species coming in, they all start with basically Artemia driven diets. Um, and, you know, even, even though we can reduce the level of Artemia in feeds substantially now, I think we, we're still going to end up with some Artemia being used right across um, all, all species. So, you know, at least for many years to come. Mm -hmm. And then if we perhaps look at the, the, the health division, you've already talked a lot about Ectus and the, you know, the, what seems to be very good progress with the field trials, yep. but there is still a process of, of, of regulation to move through. So yep. how, how would you map out the, you know, the timetable for the next couple of years in clearing those hurdles and then getting commercial revenues, not just field revenues coming yep. through? Um, so we expect to see the field trials continue through 2019. Um, and that will be, um, you know, the continuing the optimization of particularly the clean treat, but also the actual treatment regime itself for Ectosan. So there's still some more work to be done, which will take us through 2019. And we will also see them expand out into more territories. So at the moment, the work's being done just in Norway, um, and we'll see that um, expand out from there into more countries around the, around the salmon producing world mm -hmm. um, during 2019. Um, Norway being the most important market. Then. Norway being the largest mm -hmm. by a long way, um, but other markets are starting to uh, clearly come onto the radar, asking when we're going to make the product available for field trials there and start the regulatory processes in those countries. So we, we, will, we will expect to see that work carrying on through 2019 and uh, the final marketing authorization coming through in 2020. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, placing Exxon against uh, other products, uh, what would you say is the most important thing? Is it, is it the, the nature of Exxon itself that there is no impact on the fish from the treatment? Is it that clean treat and there's no environmental impact is a very important factor? Or is it a combination of the two that gives the, the, you know, the fish farmer the, the best of, of both products? Yeah, I think it's t it's, it's, there, are two, there are two separate themes here. The, the industry definitely needs a new molecule and a very effective new molecule for the treatment itself. So Ectosan provides that. It's, it's one of the most effective sea life treatments we've ever seen. Um, at the moment, it's giving 100% efficacy in every trial. So we're getting very good results. It's got a low reinfection rate, so it takes a long time for lice to reinfect fish once they've been treated. Um, and it's benign on the, on the fish themselves. They, they don't seem to even notice that they're being treated. So that, that is a very good picture and one that is attractive to our customers, they, they need that kind of product. I think Clean Treat offers them the chance to, to um, use a treatment with having no impact on the environment. There's lots of benefits for, for the industry from that. I mean, obviously, um, you know, reducing environmental impact is on everybody's agenda anyway, but also it affects the licenses so they can, can stock um, you know, they, they, the discharge agreements and so on are, will be they'll be advantaged by that. Um, and I think um, in terms of um, the long-term future for the industry, that having, having the ability to treat with no environmental impact is very important. I think that, the clean treat element of it, um, can be extended out over other products, not just Ectosan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not going to try and keep this just a benchmark. We're, we're going to allow other products to be used and in fact we've already tested most of the main molecule groups and found that it's effective with those um, and we're demonst you know, we have work stream going on demonstrating that um, at the moment and we, ex we, we expect to license products that are not coming from the benchmark pipeline in the future mm -hmm. uh, to be used through CleanTreat. 
And you're still seeing reasonable rev- revenues from Salmasan, the pre- yeah. predecessor to, to Ectosan. Yeah. Uh, is this the death knell for Salmasan, or does that have a role going forward in, in combination with the, the others? I think that, um, that Salmasan has kind of levelled off, and that's, that's how it seems to us now. So we've seen reduction in sales of Salmasan as it's beca- its mature product. Yeah, there has been some uh, resistance you know, develop in some territories, um, and we've seen sales decline as partly because of that and partly because of the arrival of generics in some markets. I think we, we seem to have levelled off. If anything, we may turn back up a little bit now. Um, that's a number of reasons for that. I think Ectosan will um, give Salmasan a bit more life because it'll introduce another product into the rotation. So it'll, it'll mean that um, we can, uh, if you like, uh, re- reinvigorate Salmasan because the the resistant lice will be killed by ectosan when they're treated with ectosan. So I think that is the first element to it. I think the se- second element is that um, we we have a new treatment regime that is being um, uh, developed at the moment with Salmasan that is proving very effective in some territories and we may see f- wider, more wider adoption of that. So that may support sales. So uh, at the moment it feels as though the decline in Samsung sales of at least levelled off may even turn up a little bit going forward from here. And before we uh, delve into the numbers a little more deeply with Mark, um, I think we should talk about your joint venture in Chile, yep. which seems to be a very sensible and important strategic move. Yeah, so Chile for us is a really important market. It's the second biggest market for salmon in the world and one which we have um, a good business structure in already with the laboratory side of our business and with the animal health product side of our business. So we we already have uh, good business going on in Chile right now. Where we'd had more problems was with the breeding side of the business. So we were importing eggs into Chile from our our, um, operation in in Iceland. And Iceland is the only country in the world that is uh, licensed to bring in stock into Chile by Mm -hmm. the Chilean regulators. Um, So we had, in principle, a good situation. The problem is that the regulators are very cautious about allowing stock in that could carry anything new in terms of diseases into the Chilean market. And every time a new disease has been found, they have closed the border while they work out whether it's a threat or not, regardless of whether it was found in our operation or in salmon even. Um, They've just been extremely cautious. And when the border gets closed, it gets closed for six, seven, eight months, and that's very disruptive to our business. Mm -hmm. Our customers don't know if they're going to get eggs or not. So we decided two or three years ago that we needed to have a position on the ground in Chile. Um, And the the joint venture that we've just announced is with Aqua Chile, who are one of the leading producers in Chile. They're the largest player um, in Chile. They have very good facilities. They have a very good team on the ground. Um, And we, we can bring new intellectual property uh, so new technology that will drive their program faster and drive the program faster for Chile. Um, and we also have a lot of know-how about land-based production mm-hmm. that we developed over many years in Iceland. We can bring that to bear on the Chilean production as well and open up the market and give us much more security of supply mm-hmm. into it and then support that from Iceland still. So we're, what would, what has been a weakness in our business will turn around yeah. into being a strength. Yeah, and, and it sounds... Uh, much, much cheaper route for you having to build it up from scratch, yeah. uh, immediate benefits, and I believe earnings per share will be accretive from, from day one with the, the yeah. combination put forward. Yeah, so it's a, you know, it, we uh, immediately ha- start with a contract with the largest producer in Chile, um, you know, a long contract, so that's, that, that's very good. Um, and yes, um, it's immediately earnings accretive. Um, and we can open up, we believe, the third-party market considerably. So today the, the JV is um, producing about 40 million eggs. We'll be, we believe over a period of um, four or five years we can turn that into a more excess of 100 million eggs. Um, so, you know, there's a, a very nice opportunity in the market there. Great. Thank you, Mark. And well, we'll come back to you for a summary, but maybe now just a few words from Mark on the numbers reported. Right, Mark. Um, Good set of numbers, uh, not too many surprises versus expectations, but what would you like to particularly draw out from the, the first half as, as significant from an investor's perspective? 
Okay, yeah, I'd say um, it was a period of good growth for us, um, particularly uh, top line growth driven by our two uh, more mature divisions, genetics and nutrition. Uh, we did see some drop back in revenue on animal health, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, we also saw the OPEX remain steady at 29% of sales, so we're beginning to see the signs of operational leverage that we've talked about previously. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw our investment in R&D stable at around 10% of sales. Uh, and in fact, from a cash flow point of view, we've seen uh, an underlying inflow from operating activities, but of course we're still in investment phase, so there's the close out of some capital investment programs, which I'll give you a bit more colour on in a minute. Um, so just digging into that in a bit more detail on the revenue line, um, Malcolm gave uh, a good uh, understanding, I think, of the key drivers behind those divisions. Um, but picking up from that, then with genetics, we saw uh, a pleasing trend of continued growth in volume of sales, but also importantly in average pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's primarily for eggs, presumably? Salmon eggs currently, mm -hmm. yeah. But overall, uh, the dynamics of genetics are such that you want to see that average price per unit go up. Mm -hmm. It's a reflection of the value, the greater value that you're providing to your customer. Um, within nutrition, that move, movement in mix in terms of the growth being driven by replacement diets and in fact the health products as well is important. They're higher margin as Malcolm said and in fact we saw a 40% growth in replacement diets uh, versus the same period in the prior year. So really significant growth there for that product line which is um, vital for the future you know, in terms of unlocking the production potential of our customers. Um, in animal health, as I mentioned, we did see a drop back in revenue. Malcolm talked a bit about Salmasan, that uh, is still the largest product in terms of revenue within that division. Uh, it did, in terms of reported numbers, uh, show a lower performance than the same period in the prior year, but underlying that, um, the unit sales were in fact at a very similar level to last year. Now the reason that the reported results are um, less favourable is that we did enter into some resetting of distributor relationships. And this is important because mm -hmm. Ectosan, the new sea lice treatment, will follow the same route into market. With the same distributors. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So we've gone now to a position of having direct sales in Chile, which also helps on the margins. Um, and we've reset the relationship in Norway, the largest market. Uh, there was some overstocking there. Now we're going to not write that inventory off. We are redeploying it into other markets. So it's very much a one-off mm -hmm. uh, impact With in the With margin benefits half. further down the line. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's timing. Um, and then if we move down uh, to gross margin, we saw you know, a good improvement there at 45% uh, versus 43 in the prior year. Uh, and as I mentioned, OPEX being um, gradually increased so it remains in line with revenue at the moment. Uh, obviously, the plan going forwards is that we will see growth on the top line uh, drive much more in the way of operating leverage for future, pe future periods. Uh, which overall means that we had an improvement on our adjusted EBITDA margin and just to remind you, adjusted EBITDA is um, EBITDA stated before deducting exceptional and acquisition related mm -hmm. costs, which actually were very minimal in this first in half, this but, but adjusted EBITDA margin of um, 8% uh, versus the 5% in the prior period, so a good trend there in terms of uh, growth in profitability. Mm -hmm. And maybe a few words on, on financial health, if you just say where you stand against covenants, it looked to have quite sure. a bit of headroom. Yeah, so um, yeah, we had a movement into uh, further internet debt at the half year point, but as expected. Um, so uh, we clearly do look very carefully at this uh, and we ensure that we remain, uh, we retain rather a good level of liquidity headroom. Um, so there, there are two key measures. One is uh, headroom in the facility itself and the cash balances that we carry. Um, and we had uh, around 22 million of headroom at the half year point on that measure and also the leverage covenant which is the main financial covenant mm -hmm. within that core group um, funding facility uh, which is net debt to EBITDA and there we saw it come in at um, 1.8 at the half year point plays three times threshold so clearly a good level mm -hmm. of headroom so we know we've got access to that facility in terms of further drawing and therefore the liquidity that I just mentioned. Um, in terms of the, cap the cash flows uh, as I said, we were continuing investment phase. We had investment capex of about 14 million in the first half of the year. About 9 million of that relates to our new genetics salmon egg production facility in Norway. 
that's coming now towards the end uh, of the project. It will be completed around the turn of the financial year. So we'll see that step down in investment capex uh, coming through into FY19. And then lastly, perhaps again top down, can you say a little bit about the impact of currencies for which obviously the dollar is very important to you? Yeah, indeed, yeah. So if we were to look at revenue on a constant currency basis, then we would have seen a 17% growth on the top line, uh, which obviously is um, a, a lot better than the 9% that we uh, are reporting. Uh, and this is due to the relative strength mm -hmm. of the pound, as you mentioned, um, period on period. Um, overall, that of course does have an impact on profitability as well. And uh, you know, we, we don't publish constant currency information at this stage, but it has, in terms of the trend, been a drag on profits uh, also. So it's something we watch very carefully. Yeah, and of course the pound does move around. So since this period, uh, we've seen you know, a decline Indeed. versus yeah. the dollar, which must help you, if not everybody else then. Yeah, indeed. And interestingly, it's now down quite close to the rates at which we were originally budgeting for this year. Yeah, so that goes to show the swing. Yeah. Good. Well, that all makes encouraging reading. And yeah. perhaps we'll now just go over to Malcolm for a summing up. OK. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Um, Malcolm, maybe just now a, a few words of, of summary and what uh, investors might be looking forward to in coming months. Uh, you've already had one or two interesting announcements since the results came out. Most recently, the appointment of another executive director. So maybe we might talk about the board, um, a new CSO and a new chairman. Yeah, so um, investors will have seen that we've been strengthening the board. Um, as the company has grown, we felt that we, we wanted to bring in some additional um, experience, skills, vision um, onto our board. And so um, initially we brought in um, Hugo Wanish, who has uh, had long experience in animal health and um, a long career, a very successful career in the animal health industry. Um, and also we brought in Ingve Murr, who again has had experience, wide experience at very senior level in the aquaculture industry running salmon and other or sea bass and sea bream businesses. Um, and so that broadened the board, uh, strengthened the board. We also brought in the Chief Scientific Officer. Um, he joins us in October. Very experienced, um, both in pure research, but also in the commercial environment, working in one of the world's largest animal health companies. Um, and brings um, a new level of um, scientific vision for the future. And I think this is, Benchmark is, is increasingly pushing out on the boundaries of, of what the application of biological science to the development of a sustainable food industry. And we need people of Alex's caliber um, to help us drive that forward and also to communicate that to both to our customers but also to the investment community so that we can um, uh, you know, bring, bring, bring along with us the, you know, our, our supporters both uh, at the customer level and in the mm -hmm. investment level. So um, he has tremendous experience and we're really excited that he's, uh, he's joining our board. He's coming in as, as the third executive director. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we recently um, uh, had join, join us um, a, a, new, a new chairman, Peter George, who had a very successful career um, latterly with Clinigen. Um, and Peter brings a, you know, an, um, a very dynamic approach um, that is actually, I think, um, imp very important, again, for us to uh, energise the next phase of our growth. We're, we're entering a phase of strong organic growth. And Peter has um, um, a nice, direct, dynamic approach. He, he is, um, he's, very, he's going to be a very strong chairman. We can see that already. So I think we've, you know, we've, with those appointments, we've, mm -hmm. we've uh, completed the, you know, the, the strengthening of the board for the next era. Yeah, well, it sounds like you know, good infrastructure, diverse portfolio, lots of highly qualified people, and hopefully lots of news flow in coming months from the products and the trials coming forward. So we wish you well for that period. Uh, there are a number of very informative slides on the Benchmark website that people may want to look at. And for those of you who want a forward view, uh, Equity Development did publish a research note just a week ago with forecasts in it. So thank you, Mark, and thank you, Malcolm, and good luck. Thank you.